welcome back to the channel. This time, we're going to share with you a topic that will help you to fundamentally understand how the PLE really works. All right. But before we get started, let's start with some questions. All right. Question number one: When I connect the PLE Lightning to a PLE switch, the power indicator doesn't line up immediately. It has a delay. And do you know that what happens during these very short moments? Question number two: What's going to happen when I connect my laptop to a PLE switch? And question number three: If the standard PSC is connected to a standard PD, how does the PSC know the voltage and power requirements of the PD? If you are curious about all of these questions. Today's topic is just the right and tailor made for you. In this so-called power handshake process or power negotiation process, let's dive right in. All right, let's start with the key steps to get the overall picture. PoE, power over Ethernet, follows IEEE L 2.3 AF 80 BT standards. And powers up the devices through the four-step negotiation process. It's like the handshake between the PSE and the PD. Step one is all about detecting if the device is connected to PD. The PSE is smart; it won't send power to anything that doesn't meet IEEE standards. And this safety check is critical to avoid frying non-PLE devices. In step two, the PSC figuring out how much power the PD actually needs by checking its power class type. Once it knows, it allocates just the right amount. No overloading, no waste. Step three, where the PSC cautiously starts delivering power at low voltage, and think of it as a soft star to make sure everything is good to go. And finally, in step four. The PSE ramps up and delivers the proper power level to fully power up the device, and just like that, your device is ready to roll. The beauty of this process is fully automatic, handled entirely by PLE hardware, and no need for you to do anything. And the whole handshake happens in just a few seconds, ensuring your devices get the right amount of power quickly and safely. Next. Let's take a closer look at the detailed process and what exactly happens during each step. Step one, detection. The first thing the PSC does is check if the connected device is IEEE 2.3 compliant PD. If it's not, the PSC won't send any power. Which is a built-in safety feature to protect the non-PoE devices from, you know, getting damaged. And at this point, the answer to the second question, what happens if you connected the PoE switch to your laptop? The answer is nothing burned out, nothing damaged, and nothing happened with power. However, the computer will get connected through, the, you know, the Ethernet for data. However, keep this in mind. This comes with one condition: the PoE switch must be standard PoE switch, meaning it complies with IEEE 802.3 standards, or what you might call that active PoE switch. If it's a passive one, the laptop's Ethernet port may get burned out due to you know excessive voltage, and you know even in more severe cases, it could you know cause irreparable damage to the laptop's motherboard. Here's how it works. During the detection step, the PSC sends a very low voltage between 2.7 and 10.1 volts, and it checks the current. Basically, it's looking for specific resistance called the PoE characteristic resistance, and that fits within the PoE standards. If the resistance matches up, the PSC knows the device is a PoE compatible. And it moves on to the next step, figuring out how much power to deliver. Step two, classification. When the power source equipment the PSC meets the power of the device PD, they have a little chance to figure out how much power the PD needs. PD, hey, I need this much power to run properly. The PSC, cool. I have got you covered. Here's what I can give. 
This is called classification. It's like a handshake or negotiation for power delivery. Type is how they do the handshake. Well, class is the actual amount of the power the PSC delivers and the PD can use. Since the PoE works over Ethernet cables that can stretch up to 100 meters, there's a bit of the power loss along the way. But no worries, the system accounts for that. Now, here's how this plays out depending on the type of device, type one. The PSC starts by sending a voltage 50.5 volts to 20.5 volts to see how much current the PD pulls. Based on that, it decides which class the PD falls into. Once the power traveled through the cables and reaches the PD, it's a bit lower, around 14.5 volts to 20.5 volts, but still enough to get the job done. Type 2. Type 2 gets a little fancier. After the initial test, the PD pulls more current, 40 milliamps to say, hey, I need a class 4 power. If the PSC is only type 1, it will go, huh, I can't do that. So here's a class 3 power instead. But if the PSC is type 2, it's like, got it, let me double check. It then sends back two pulses to confirm and deliver the requested power. Type 3 and type 4. Here's where it gets exciting. For devices that need serious juice, type 3, the PSC sends four pulses, which means you're good to up to 60 watts. And type 4, the PSC sends five pulses, signaling here's a big leak, up to 100 watts. The PD starts process by pulling 40 milliamp for the first two pulses, basically saying, I need a high power. Then it dials the back to lower current to let the PSC know the specific needs. By the third process, the PSC has already figured out the extra process. They are just the PSC confirming. All right, here's what I'm giving you. So if the PD asks for class 7 or 8 power and the PSC supports type 2, the PD gets the high power it wants. If the PD only needs class 5 or 6 power and the PSC is a type 3, no problem, it still gets what it will ask for. It's just the type 3's limits. And that's it. PO is a power negotiation process. Told like, you know, the friendly back and forth. Power demotion is a feature in the PSC protocol that kicks in when the power device PD asks for more power than the power sourcing equipment can handle. In this case, the PSC automatically reduces the amount of the power it provides to avoid overloading itself. This happens during the power negotiation phase, where the PD reports how much power it needs and the PSC adjusts the output based on its own limits. For example, if the PD requests a class 8 power, but the PSC only support class 6, the PSC will downgrade the PD to type 3 and supply it with class 6 power instead. The downside? If the PD doesn't get enough power, it might end up underpowered, which could affect its normal operation. Step 3. Start up. Once the classification phrase is done, the PSC starts supplying power to the PD, but it begins at a low voltage. This initial power up phrase lasts for a short configurable period, usually less than 15 microseconds, where the voltage slowly ramps up until it reaches to the standard 48 volts DC needed to power the device. Step 4. Power on. When the voltage reaches 48 volts DC, the PSC enters a stable phase. At this point, the PoE power supply is fully up and running, delivering a steady and reliable 48 volts DC output to the PD for the continuous operation. All right, let's talk about the benefits of this four-stage PoE power process. 
When using a PoE, Power Over Ethernet technology, this process ensures the power device, PDs, get the right amount of the power safely with and without risk of any damage. For instance, if you plug a 15 watts of AF device into the 19 watt BT PoE port, the PoE switch automatically adjusts and negotiates the power supply. It switches to AF mode and it delivers only the 15 watts that devices need. Even though the port can supply much higher power, the device won't get overloaded or damaged. It's all handled automatically. And now, if you are connecting a non-PoE device to the standard PoE port, the system is smart enough to detect it. The four-step process ensures that a PoE switch operates in non-PoE mode for that connection. So, the device is safe. You can mix PoE and non-PoE devices on the same PoE switch without worrying about damage. But it's a different story with the passive PoE switches, which don't follow this safety step. They skip the detection and classification process, meaning they can push a full unregulated power to whatever connected. This can easily damage devices that are designed to handle it. Making a passive PoE switcher is a much riskier choice compared to a standard IEEE L2.3 AFATBT compliant switchers. And also, watch out for some budget PoE switchers on the market that rely on software stimulation instead of the popper's hardware chipset for power management. Well, software-based solution might manage basic tasks like you know, detection and classification, they are often less stable and can struggle with compatibility. And this could lead to your device not being recognized properly or experiencing unreliable power delivery. Unlike switches with high-quality hardware-based PoE systems, in short, sticking with the standard hardware-based PoE switches is the safest and the most reliable option. There's a limitations. If you're using a non-standard power device, PDs, it's the best to go with a passive PoE switch. Here's a why. Standard PoE switches are designed to work with a device that follows the IEEE standard, IEEE 02.3 FATBD protocols. They use these protocols to detect and classify the connected device before supplying the power. If your PD doesn't follow these standards, a standard PoE switch is likely won't recognize it and it won't deliver any power. In contrast, a passive PoE switch doesn't require this protocol handshake and it can supply power directly to non-standard devices. Just keep in mind that passive PoE switches don't have the same safety features. So make sure your non-standard PD is compatible with the power being supplied.